The term influencer gets thrown around a lot these days, and it's not hard to understand why. The creator economy continues to grow and grow, enabling independent artists and thinkers to express themselves and make money doing it. But like all these trends, there are those at the beginning who saw sparks of potential and thought, what if I could do something with this? One of those early thinkers, and perhaps one of the very first, was Jim Louderback. Jim generously chatted with me about how he started as a product tester at Ziff Davis Publishing, building a YouTube-centric network in Revision 3, and then leading the influencer convention VidCon through acquisition, and later, the pandemic. He shares his philosophies on how to experiment as a creator, how to make teams that can address new challenges, and his thoughts on how to keep the work of building fun, even when it's not. This is Jim Louderback. Welcome to Building Value. I'm Jason Nellis, and I'm obsessed with the intersection of creativity and technology. I started my career at Hulu, built products from the ground up at Facebook, and founded a few companies in between. Each episode, I talk to folks at the same intersection, whose career paths have had unexpected twists and turns. We talk about what gets them up in the morning, what keeps them up at night, and what helps them grow. If you like what you hear and you want to get more, subscribe on YouTube or wherever you consume fine podcast products. And here we are with the man himself, Jim Louderback. Jim, thanks so much for joining, man. How are you today? I'm doing good. Thank you. It's nice to be oh. here. It's nice to be here with you. It's nice to be here with you. You know, you and I go back. I mean, let's just put it out there. We've known each other for a minute. Um, I think we probably got to know each other in the days of Hulu and Revision 3, if memory serves mm -hmm. correctly. Yep. When, I was, when I was a Wii account manager and you were the BMOC at Rev3, um, which I... I now that I've said it out loud, I hope you have that on a T-shirt somewhere. I feel like that's a missed opportunity, if not. I don't, but CEO is probably good enough. You know, that's better. Okay, that's better. That's fine. Yeah, um, it's, less, it's one less letter. It's true. It, it's it's bigger on your T-shirt when it's one less letter. Notice that it's almost spring training and I have four letters here. I was going to say M-E-T-S, Mets, Mets, Mets. Let's, let's go I Mets. See, I can <laughs> see where your loyalties lie, and I approve. Um very cool, man. Well, I'd love to dive in head first and just, you know, first ask about your career. I mean, you have probably one of my favorite careers in all of media because you've seen 16 different angles of it. Uh, you know, certainly starting in the in the early days of media and technology where you were at, uh, I mean, you were at Ziff Davis and, you know, Rev3. I mean, take us through the whole sort of arc of your career. How did you get from, you know, graduation to where you are today? So, yeah, I, I mean... It was, I just kept on felling into things that looked like fun. Uh, when I graduated um, grad school, went for college grad school, graduated, went and did consulting. And this was in the early days of the personal computer when everybody was running things on mainframe computers, big mainframe computers in the basement. And the personal computer was just coming out. And, you know, I, it was a huge revolution in the business computing space, as big as the internet, as big as anything. And really, you know, the early on tied my hat to that, doing consulting, building systems at big companies like Citibank and Morgan Guarantee and small companies like the guys who make the elevators go up and down in buildings around New York City, Century Elevator, and automating them in ways that they could not do with big computers. And so I started writing about it. So I, I was a math major and did computers and got an MBA. And so I was not a media person. I have no background, I have no journalism background, no training in media, but I started writing about it anyway, um, writing about what I was doing, getting into some of the early online forums like CompuServe and, um, and just, you know, writing the, the, like a little methodology on rapid development on PCs and, um, and wrote a, you know, a, a, a guest column for this little magazine called PC Week, which was the Bible newspaper, the B2B thing for the early days of the PC industry. Never thought I'd get a job there, but I think, you know, maybe someday I'd get a column in a computer magazine. And there was an ad in the New York Times for lab director at PC Week a couple of years into this. And I was like, well, they're not going to hire me, but I'll at least meet them. I went up there and, uh, you know, at this point I'd been doing consulting. I had, I don't know, five or six clients that were paying lots of money. I had a, making a good salary, but I went up there to meet with those guys in Boston. I was in New York at the time, you know, doing stuff, doing business all over the country. And um, they gave me the job. So it was like going from, I got five or six clients paying a lot of money to 250,000 readers that aren't really paying anything, but it just sounded like fun. So my wife and I uprooted, moved to Massachusetts, and I ran reviews in the lab and built that up for PC Week. 
That's pretty cool. I mean, talk about getting in early. The The interesting thing to me is that we're talking about something that was a physical magazine, right? I mean, it wasn't, this isn't some online publication that was dependent on ads and impressions. This was back in sort of the golden age of media. Did you find you had a lot of flexibility? Was that the kind of work where you could sort of experiment or were there very specific narrow band, uh, narrow limitations around which you could sort of grow? Oh, oh, this was a magazine that made a lot of money. Uh, it was advertising and uh and advertising um and so that was you know it was fairly rigid in as much as like they but they were they started out as a new there's a news weekly you know it's like the time magazine of computers uh and it, for business uh or the business week of computers i guess is a better analogy but they were because they were doing all news they started to get into reviews and the the nice thing they brought me in for and then i had the ability to build this up was news as reviews so when that new piece of hardware, let's see if I can find one over here. Oh, ah, going this, back this, to the this, archives. This, this, this was our rumor cat, by the way, Spencer's cat. <laughs> but um, let's say when the uh, a mobile device came out with a keyboard that you could use to do email from anywhere called the BlackBerry. It's upside down. Called the BlackBerry. That would have been good. I haven't been doing this for a while. So we would get them early. And as they came off NDA, as they were announced, because we had it a week or two in advance, we would have a re review available the day it launched. That blew people's minds. So it was able to craft that concept of product review as news for this leading newspaper in the B2B PC business. And so within those constraints, it was a lot of fun. We got to do a lot of really cool things. I love that. How do you compare that to the modern age where you know, there's an embargo on a new, let's say it's a new Samsung phone. And then the day it launches, 50 influencers have kind of similar reviews in terms of specs and, anal and analyzing sort of where it sits within the place in the market. Do you feel like back then it was uh, a little bit easier to have sort of a precious hold on those reviews or was it we just did that more first? Than so yeah. they came to us because nobody else was doing it. Sure. And then as other people were like, oh, we could do that. More and more people started doing it. But the idea of news as uh, you know, a product review as news was something that we pioneered at PC Week. And we, you know, because before I got there, and by the way, this wasn't my idea. They knew they wanted to do it, which is why they brought me in. But before I got there, it was your standard newspaper. We, you know, every Thursday, we would have a page one meeting where all the stories that came out that week, we'd pick the ones that were most important. And we'd sit around just like at the New York Times and figure out what's going on, the, you know, the front page of our newspaper that it was weekly so when it when people got it on monday and when we started doing this reviews as news thing i would go into those meetings as the guys guy ran the lab and the news and say well i got the first phone that's got a freaking keyboard on it and this should be on the front page and all the reporters are like ah, that's not news and the editor-in-chief was smart enough to be like that's our lead story on monday so that was really fun too going up you know i won't call them crusty old journalists but some of them were Going up against them as this, you know, young guy like this is just as newsworthy as your scoop on, you know, IBM's latest VP of corporate blah, blah, blah. Right. I do. I do have this image in my head of you uh, pitching in a large meeting to a, uh, you know, a Perry White, you know, a cigar, a cigar chomping, you know, suspender wearing lean back kind of guy with, you know, all these other uh, giants of their space. And you as sort of a little Clark Kent being like, I've got the scoop. You didn't know this, but I've got it. Yeah. Um, well, and I wasn't very... allowed to tell them what I had until that meeting because we had a wall. I mean, we were on the first floor. They were on the third floor. They couldn't the reporters couldn't come into the lab. And one of the things that was really, you know, it was a really big deal was going out and talking to all of the PR people and the other folks at these companies and, and convincing them that giving it to us, you know, I saw the lock on the door and the fact that nobody could get in, but me and my team, that their, their cool product was safe from the best reporters in the industry upstairs. Right. Right. You got to you got to have that. You got to have that delineation. God forbid that, you know, somebody's uh, uh, newfangled uh, notions uh, break into the the old staunch way of doing things or uh, or like and this, yeah. uh, by the way, this is Spencer, the cat and nice, Spencer, the cat was the rumor cat. So it was a column that was written on the back page where when a story, you know, stories needed two sources. If you only had one source, you couldn't write a story about it. But the cat knows all. <laughs> so the cat would do the column and it was an anonymous column because you never knew who the cat Wait, was. I'm sorry. Let me just clarify. Are you telling me that PC week had a page six anonymous gossip source? And I didn't know that until this moment. It was the last page of PC week. <laughs> 
So it was like yes, page 32. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or 64 or, <laughs> right. you know, we were in, in the day, we were what's known as saddle stitch, which meant that we, you know, it was just like page after page after page folded over and stitched. But, uh, you know, by 97, this was, this is in the early nineties, mid nineties by 97 at Comdex, which is where this guy is from. Um, the, it was so big that it was actually perfect bound, which is what most magazines, you know, that actually have on the back. It's actually rectangular. That is perfect bound because there's glue in there. So it got big enough. And I think anything over 96 pages had to be perfect bound. Interesting. Again, learning things about. I can't believe I still remember that. I mean, that's pretty good, all things considered. Yeah. Um, so take me through then how that leads to ZDTV on cable. Because I know that you helped pioneer a lot of content that was really technology centric in video format as well. That must have been where you got to experiment a lot. Actually, even before that, and I think like I got to PC Week in 91. Uh, and then two years later, uh, and I was, I had, a year later, we moved out to California because they'd consolidated all of their reviews folks, or two years later, they'd consolidated their reviews folks in California by like 93, 94. And, uh, and then I moved out and we moved all of our labs out there. But um, they saw what was going on with television and were very forward thinking and said, we're going to do a show about computers and did a, did a show called The Personal Computing Show. And it was, we bought time on CNBC on the weekends and we had a half hour show, right? 93, 94. There's still, it's still out there on YouTube. I can send you the link. Gina Smith, Leo Laporte and I were on that show. And this is where, and again, this is something that uh, I gotta say, I kind of like, I think I'm the person to do this first. I was the first person to do video reviews of technology. Um, there would be I a am new watching, product. I am watching a young Jim Ladderback currently talk to me alongside Gina Smith about yeah. new, uh, it appears to be a new motherboard and some of the new software that you can install once it's taken care of. Uh, this is pretty yeah. cool. Yeah. Anyway, so I wasn't, we weren't necessarily completely unboxing because it wasn't like I was getting the new thing in and I was taking it, uh, you know, it was like, oh my gosh, I can't believe it's got buttons. But it was close enough. Like the idea of a video review of a computer product, you know, we started that. And I, I, love I was the one who did it first, I think. Who knows? Maybe not. But I was very early on with it. Well, I'm, I'm saying this out loud so that I make sure I, I note it. The, the Jim Ladderbeck, the original unboxer, I'm putting that. That's the yeah, title. Some, of something like that. Um, yeah. Yeah. And so look, that, that, so your question was about ZDTV. And so that was popular. We had Gateway as our sponsor, Gateway Computers, so they could sell more computers. It was good. It didn't work that well. But a couple of years later, as the internet started to come out, Ziff Davis partnered up with Microsoft and NBC when they launched MSNBC. And there was a program on MSNBC for an hour a day called The Site. And The Site was a partnership between Ziff Davis, NBC, and Microsoft. It was hosted by Soledad O'Brien. Leo Laporte was there as uh, full-time, um, but also the voice of the virtual character, Dev Null. And, um, and uh, I would fly out and do, because uh, I was back living on the East Coast at that point, took over as editor-in-chief of Windows Sources, uh, and eventually PC Week, I became the editorial director. But, um, but uh, would fly out and, and gang shoot like five or six reviews that they would drop in every couple weeks. And so that ran for a year. Um, as MSNBC tried to figure out what it was going to be. And then Princess Diana died and MSNBC realized that it would be what we called at the time, the morning channel, because they basically did wall to wall coverage of Princess Diana's death and everybody in mourning and kicked the site off. And they realized that was a better model for them. So that uh, whole technology thing went away. But at the same time, the company said, this is successful. This is good. Let's launch a cable network about technology. Uh, we already have a lot of really smart people in house. Let's call it ZDTV. And it, this is in 1997. And uh, they were like, Jim, you want to come be the head of content there? We got this, you know, a couple of people who are really good at television who are going to come out and run the TV side. We need somebody who's like knows the Ziff Davis way about products and can build that up. So ZDTV launched. I was there. Leo was there. We brought Patrick Norton over from Windows Sources, the magazine that I was running before. Uh, and a lot of really, really good, famous people, um, talented people. And we launched the first cable network about technology in 1998. So 97, we all went out there. 98, we launched. And it was, 
I mean, it was a big deal. We did a lot of really innovative things there. I mean, I'll tell you another thing we did. Two things at ZDTV that was super fun. The first was um, we were the first TV network to put our viewers on live. Me and another person went out and did a deal with 3Com at the time who were making tiny little Q-SIP cameras, 320 by 240s, the first video cameras you can plug into your computer via the serial port, really low bandwidth, but it was video. And we started the ZDTV NetCam Network. And so Leo Laporte would do call for help or screensavers live. Uh, and they would say, well, let's go to the ZDTV NetCam Networks. You know, we'd have a little 3Com logo in there because they gave us 50,000 cameras or 10,000 to give away to our, our viewers. And we would go to somebody in Nebraska, in Ohio, in Oklahoma, in California, all wherever they could see us, which wasn't very many places at the time. But anyway, and we would put them on TV and we'd have a conversation with them. And that was revolutionary. And then the other thing we did, and this is, I, I, I led this with another person is you go to CES now, right? And you see the best of CES and it's, I don't know, CNET did it for a long time. And, uh, and I, I don't even know who does it now. But we were the first. We went to DC. We went to CES and said, we will come and we will broadcast wall to wall on ZDTV CES. And we will do the first best of CES awards. And we did. So I built a whole group of like 20 people. They went out and tested products. And we did a big thing there. And, um, you know, we gave out the awards. And we did that for a few years until, you know, until you know, ZDTV fell apart. It became Tech TV. And then it, it was, uh, and then it got sold to Comcast. But anyway, a um, couple of really fun things there that we kind of pioneered there too. There's so much there to unpack, but the one thing that's really interesting to me is talking, it was thinking about the idea of being the first to call out the best products of each year. I'm, I'm kind of shocked that that wasn't a thing that was built into CES because now it's such a standard, not just from, you know, the independent media companies that are there covering all of it, but you almost see now whether it's, you know, Innovation Alley or some of the other spots, like it, it, CES kind of does it for itself now. It's right. Of, they know, have the Innovation Award, exactly, right. yeah, which they do. They yeah. may have done that before that, but it, the fact that they had a media partner who was going out, we were actually testing products on the show floor and evaluating them and doing the best of that way. We had categories. Um, so anyway, and then, and then there was, you know, there was Comdex before that, that um, people would do it in, but nobody did it for CES. Was there a best of Comdex? Now I got to look up on the internet. Well, while you do, take me a little bit through how that transitioned into Revision 3. Because, you know, when, again, when I was uh, at Hulu some years ago, uh, Revision 3 was, you know, I was 23 at the time when I joined Hulu. You know, Revision 3 was the place where you got your sort of uh, most cutting edge news and, and content around what was happening in the tech world. So between, mm -hmm. you know, Techzilla, Dignation, um, I was reminded the other day of Red 3 Games that I, I think you might have even, were you the creator of that? Well, um, I mean, I, I mean yeah. at Revision 3, I was CEO, right? I had a great right. group of people that were building all this stuff. And a lot of them came from tech TV. Um, so yeah, we built all of that. I mean, I, I, at that point I was not the one coming up with the ideas. I was the one looking for money to fund the ideas. Well, tell me that transition because, you know, I, I know that a lot of folks who start as influencers in the modern sort of telling of the story, you know, they start as influencers, they're doing everything, they're scripting, they're shooting, they're editing, they're producing. And then as time goes on and they build bigger teams, they end up having to take more of a leadership role that's much more strategic and ends up being much more financial. Um, what was that like? I mean, I assume that ZDTV helped train you for that, but going to Revision 3 must have been a pretty significant shift into full executive mode at that point. Well, yes and no. I mean, look, I got an MBA. I was always focused on running things. I came in and built the lab and built it to, you know, we had 30 or 40 people in the lab. And uh, at ZDTV, Tech TV, we launched this thing called, you know, called, um, we, we launched live news, Tech TV Now, Tech Now, I forget what it was called, Tech Now, I think. But anyway, with, you know, and it was like CNBC killer in the dot com run up. And I built a team of like 200 people that I ran. So being, you know, running organizations like that was what I was always thought I was going to do. Uh, and even when I left Tech TV, I went back and was editor in chief of PC Magazine. So I ran the whole magazine of, you know, 100, 120 people across digital and, and non. So that was not it. The, the big thing was going from an established media company for me to building a small company, starting with like four or five people. And we just raised, you know, seven or eight million dollars. 
And how do you build a company like that from scratch and make it relevant and make the decisions and bring in the right team? And so the, the real thing for me was starting from scratch and being able to, and, and being a CEO where, you know, I, I, I couldn't do everything. I had to bring in really smart people to run sales, to run content, to run marketing, to run the infrastructure, to run the technology, things that I have felt like I knew a lot about, but had to move away from, oh, I'm going to be responsible for everything and dictate everything to, no, I'm going to hire really smart people to do it. That's a transition. That's a tough one. I'll bet. What was your philosophy around the team building? I mean, you said, you know, hire smart people, but that only gets you so far. Were you thinking more, you know, lean and broad, right? We want one person to do these three different hats simultaneously, or were you thinking more sort of, you know, I, I want to build, you know, the content person is going to be sort of very sectioned off in this space. And I want to give them as much time as they can in that specific vertical versus the sales folks. And I, I want to limit how much they bother each other. Like what was your general philosophy in building those teams? Well, the philosophy, I mean, we'd raised money at the time. So we had the money to sort of build out a team for growth, which, mm -hmm. is, which was good. Uh, so hired a head of sales who I'd worked with at, um, you know, we worked together at, uh, at tech TV. He did a lot of sales there. He was great. He actually like really, if there was any person responsible for revision three success, it was Brad Murphy because he really drove our, our monetization, our sponsorship, but he knew content and loved creators and still does in what he does. Uh, and so he was super innovative in what he built and how he built it and the in-show sponsorships that we did. Hired a head of content uh, to come in and do that. Um, hired, and then, you know, and, and, and hired a head of technology. Actually, we already had a head of technology that, to come in and, and kind of run all the tech background. So we, it was really, you know, and then, and then eventually, you know, a year in hired a head of marketing. It was really set up so that we could, you know, really have these groups that could go out and do what they needed to do to build a big company. Love that. How did the rise of uh, Revision 3 parallel in your mind to the rise of YouTube, right? Because you joined Revision 3 in 2007. YouTube was starting to find its, you know, really its its footing and then its scale over the, you know, over the following five years, about the same time you were at Revision 3. Did you see a lot of commonality between what people were doing online independently versus what you guys were doing? I mean, was there a big differentiation between it just purely on content strategy or even quality? I mean, where do you see sort of the overlap or the distinction? Well, you know, when we started um, and when Revision 3 really got going, it was built in, in large part around Dignation. So Dignation and Dig, Dignation and, and Revision 3 were both started by Kevin Rose uh, and folks. And Kevin had been at ZDTV, Tech TV. Uh, and they, you know, they raised money for both. And Dignation, even though Kevin was the host of it and he was the CEO of, uh, ended up being the CEO of Dig and was running Dig, you know, that was a big part of what we did. So they were, these were video podcasts. Video podcasts are not a new thing. This was once you could, back in those days, back in old days, you couldn't stream them because there wasn't enough bandwidth for most people. So it was, you'd put these video podcasts up on iTunes and other places and that you could download them and watch them later. Uh, eventually it became streaming. I mean, rather quickly it became streaming. But back then, a lot of it was download and, and consume later. And so we had, we were all video podcasts that we started putting out on different platforms. And there were 20 or 30 online video platforms of which YouTube was just one. Rever, Break, Blip, um, Vio, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so we would, we would super distribute to all those platforms, as did a couple of other companies like Next New Networks, who was an early one out there also. They came up with this whole super distribution concept, which we're like, that's really smart. We're gonna do that too. Um, but in 2008, um, there was a big crash and it was, you know, and, and it was about midway through the year and there was a big market crash because of financial stuff. And all the VCs are like, you got to like lay off half your staff and it's nuclear winter. And if you want to survive, you got to do this. And you know, it, it, it was a big deal because all the advertising dollars dried up and we were already putting our stuff on YouTube at that time. But at that point, you know, I had to lay off a third of the staff, which I did. We really cored down to a core team on a core set of things that we were doing that were making money. And we looked out at, uh, at YouTube and where things were going. And I made, we, well, you know, as a team, we made the decision that we were going to pivot to being a YouTube network and we were going to find technology, gamer, science, other people that were in, that were creating for YouTube and go all in on YouTube. And that was a big deal. You know, I had a bunch of people who've been working in TV and they were looking at some of these YouTubers, like, you know, like John Rettinger, Techno Buffalo was, and, uh, and Mark Watson from uh, Soldier Knows Best were some of the early 
creators in the tech space that we signed, they were looking at us, that's not television. That's not what we do. Look at the quality. They're just like right there. And they're just like showing stuff off like this. And you can't even tell what they're doing, but it's like, you know what? They were reaching through the camera and grabbing you and sucking your eyeballs in and building community. And so by 2010, we were hundred percent moved to that plot, that model. We were, like I said, a really early YouTube network. We were one of the few that were allowed to do in-show sponsorships. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so we became 100% YouTube. I, I do want to call out the the, the uh, prophetic nature of that uh, uh, hiring uh, strategy in terms of guys like John Rettinger and Mark Watson, both of whom still have big, thriving YouTube communities around them, and they're still doing what they do pretty successfully. So kudos to you. You clearly had an eye for talent back in the day. Yeah, they were amazing. And, and it wasn't just that. You know, we were having fun with lots of stuff. Like this show Scam School that we did was um, – you know, another one, Brian Brushwood, who is a the punk magician, um, came in with an, one of the other guys that we had been working with, uh, one of one of my, you know, one of the folks on my team. It was like, I really want to do this great proposal. I was like, oh, yeah, this is great. So we did that. And, you know, and he's still out there doing stuff, too, and is amazing. So there's a, there's some early talent that we sort of brought in. We helped develop. Um, you know, Ryan Vance, who was running our content, was really good at developing talent and building stuff out. Did a great job there. Did a great job with like, you know, a, a lot of different creators that kind of fit our mold, which was very focused on tech and guys and, you know, and gaming and things like that. Talk to me about how that then transitioned to the thing that that I think if anybody in the space knows you from most recently, it's got to be VidCon, right? The biggest annual gathering of creators and their fans globally now in multiple cities you were there as you started as the the editorial director for the industry track. You eventually took over as CEO and GM, helped get it sold to Viacom, turn it into now. I mean, it's prolific. The size of VidCon. I mean, the first time I went to VidCon, can I just say, and I, I don't know that I actually saw you at this VidCon, but the first time I went to VidCon, I was overwhelmed by a group of about 120 kids rushing Markiplier who made the mistake of walking you know, into, you know, public traffic for half a second and, and just watching a bunch of kids just like try to, I, I assume, consume him. I, I don't know what else they were aiming for with that rush of people. Connect um, with him. Connect. Sure. Connect. Let's go with connect. Could have been a physical uh, connection, but connect. Sure. <laughs> but I, I think, you know, the thing that's most interesting to me about that is that your background, I mean, I can't think of a more perfect place to, to land given the history of your your career that we just heard right the the you know the mba executive direction the you know really in the muck creative writing direction the thinking about strategic and business building all of it when that came to you i mean when you were there as the editorial director was you were you thinking you wanted to eventually take it on or was it just an opportunity to help connect with creators now here's how here's how it really happened so we sold revision 3 to discovery in 2012 it was one of the early uh, mcn selling you went in there, started up a whole bunch of digital networks for them, ran discover, built and ran Discovery Digital Networks, et cetera. You know, after a couple of years, and like, I've been in big media companies, that can be exhausting. And Discovery was no different. I have no idea uh, what you're talking about. And uh, yeah, you know what I mean. And so um, 2014, towards the end of 2014, uh, I was like, I'm done. And so um, kind of figured that out. And, 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 and I had a non-compete. Uh, and I wasn't allowed to go work in a media business for another year or two. And I'm like, that's fine. Cause they're still paying me. Uh, I was still getting like my, my earn out payouts, you know, retention payments, whatever. And, uh, and it, but back, you know, let's go back a couple of years to 2010 in 2010, we had gone to YouTube. We had a lot of great creators there. We were trying to bring on new creators that were science and geeky and techie focused. And we had run it, you know, we really wanted to get this guy Hank Green on and his brother, John, because they fit our audience perfectly. We really wanted Veritasium. We really wanted a lot of those science creators. Turns out the science creators, and they were all super smart. They're like, yeah, we don't want to join one of these stupid MCNs. We're just going to keep doing what we do. Um, but Hank was great because he's like, oh, you might really like this guy who ended up like doing some stuff with me. I said, oh, by the way, I'm starting this event called called VidCon because I think it's good to bring people together. And I was like, I'd done events before, you know, obviously doing the stuff at CES and Convex and, and other things. I'm like, events are perfect for this space. We absolutely need it. What can I do to help? We sponsored, I spoke at the first one along with, you know, the 30 people who spoke there. 2010 in the summer, in the basement of the Hyatt in Century City in, uh, in LA, 
across the street from CAA, the world's biggest talent agency, I think at the time, there's even like an underground tunnel between the Hyatt and CAA, I guess, so that the famous people could sleep at the Hyatt and go to CAA without going outside. Because, you know, the weather's always terrible in LA. Um, but anyway, uh, it was amazing. I remember calling up some of my friends in the traditional media. I'm like, you have to come down here on a Saturday to see what's going on. Nobody knew the world was changing there. So anyway, I digress. So, you know, over the time between 2010 and 2014, I had been, you know, back pocket sort of advisor to Hank and John. And we sold it in 2012. We sold a discovery in 2013. They were really leaning in hard to the creator economy. We had Phil DeFranco as part of, uh, part of our network. And they, we got Phil DeFranco to host Shark Week. And um, at the time, they really wanted at VidCon to bring in more big media companies, and they knew I was working at one. And Shark Week started a week after VidCon. And they had come up with this 60-foot mechanical shark that they were wheeling around for promotional purposes in California. And I convinced the Discovery people to bring the shark to VidCon, and they did. And there are videos and pictures on the internet of the shark. It actually, you know, the mechanical shark, it could crunch things. It crunched iJustine's mobile iPhone. It crunched the the, the, the source-fed couch uh, and it, all kinds of stuff. And it was, uh, it was a really big deal. Um, so when I left, you know, obviously I got to know the VidCon people really well. And I called up Hank and I remember called him up. I'm like, yeah, I'm leaving VidCon. I can't go and work in media. I could just chill. But, you know, I love VidCon. Can I help you with anything? And the timing was fortuitous because he was, at that point, it was, it was, VidCon was one track and then it went to sort of an industry day before. And then they had a little industry track, but they were adding in the creator track and they said it was going to be a three track show. And they're like, why don't you come in and really define the industry track and build it into a big thing? And I'm like, yeah, I got nothing else to do for the next year. Sure, I'll do that. VidCon's really fun. And then, you know, once my non-competes up, I'll go do something else. Well, I did it and I was having so much fun. I just kept doing it. So 15, 16, 17, just kept on building the industry track and having fun with it, uh, as well as doing like a lean into uh, to venture a little bit and just doing consulting with National Geographic on the and, and learning about lots of other fun things. Um, and then in 2017, in 2016, they decided to go international with it. It's like, let's do a show in Australia. Let's do a show in uh, the Netherlands. And I'm like, well, and we're bringing the industry track there, right? And so we did. And, you know, one was good. One was not so good. In mid-2017, I think Hank and John and his dad got together. And we're like, it's been a good run. We uh, built this company up. Uh, we have no investment. We have no debt. All of the risk is on us. If there were an earthquake, for example, in Anaheim, around the show, they would have lost everything. So they said, yeah, maybe now's the time to exit. And so they came to me after VidCon in 2017 in Anaheim in the summer, like, you wanna come be our CEO and maybe sell this thing so that, you know, cause you've sold stuff before. And, uh, and I was like, okay. So I did, five months later, we sold to Viacom. Not bad. Yeah. Not bad. Some of the, that was really fast. Yeah, yeah. So, but then you're, Leading, you're leading VidCon, right? You're now you got Viacom who wants to, you know, build at scale. And actually, now that you mentioned it, I think 2017 was my first VidCon. So of course, I got to see it before it turned into the thing it is today. Which isn't to say it's bad. It's glorious to see how it can, you know, scales to new cities and opens up opportunities for new creators. But to see it in its original form, right? To see it in sort of its its intended original form. It's, um, it's pre corporate behemoth ownership form. Right. Exactly. Um, but then you're there and, and uh, you know, I remember we got into 2020 and the pandemic hits and now there can't be a VidCon. There can't be any in-person events, uh, which is where you and I reconnected at Super uh, at Meta when yep. we were, you know, I was hosting for you guys, which um, I have to say was one of the most fun experiences so of my fun. existence. Thank you again for that opportunity, can I just say. Um, but I, I think what's interesting to me is that you guys came out of it with really strategic planning. It wasn't where a lot of other companies were throwing things at the wall. It really felt to us like, okay, we're going to really, we're going to move things online. We're going to approach this very systemically. We're going to really think about how to keep our audience engaged and to do so as soon as it's an opportunity, as soon as there's an opportunity to do it safely in person, we're going to do so. Even to the point where, if I remember correctly, you were going to do it again in 2021 and then pulled back on it because it wasn't clear that there was going to be enough safety measures in place to do it properly. So that must have been, I mean, there must have been 
a lot going on behind the scenes to make that decision. But, but again, you know, to do it in a way that is respectful of people's health and safety, and then to still lean into this digital strategy, how did you juggle so much? I mean, how did you do that without losing your mind? Well, you know, part of, I think, being able to adapt to unfortunate, to, you know, unforeseen circumstances is having a strong strategic plan in place. And I did this at Revision 3. I did this at VidCon when I took over as CEO, where we sat down and said, look, we're going to come up with a strategic plan. We needed it to sell the company because we had to sell the dream. But it always, to me, starts with 20 years from now, what's the big thing we want to do? Um, and at, at Revision 3, it was, we wanted to be a billion-dollar media company. And, well, we sort of got there in five years because we sold a discovery, so we were part of a billion-dollar media company. So I'll take that. In 2017, I said, we want, you know, our, we, and not I, we all, and it's not all about, it's not me, it's we all sit down as an exec team and go through this. Come up. In 2017, it was, we want to have a VidCon on every continent in the United, in, in the world, except Antarctica, because penguins can't make videos. And we want to, we want to, we want to have a million attendees. That was our big goal for 20 years. Well, when you have a big goal like that, and it's consistent when, when life throws you curveballs, you say, how does this, how does our strategic plan apply to this? And we realized that we could actually accelerate our strategic plan because going hundred percent digital, which people were doing allowed us to do VidCons all over the world and allowed us to have attendees come in from all over the world. And so during the lockdown, during COVID, that in 2020, we had one and a quarter million unique people that attended our digital VidCon events. And by 2021, we had done digital VidCon events everywhere in the world. We did them in Asia and Singapore. We did one in South Africa. We did multiple, you know, we'd already done physical ones in Australia and physical ones in Europe. Uh, and so we were able to, and, and we did it in South America because we had, we did Mexico virtually, and then we did stuff in, uh, in Brazil and Argentina virtually. So we were able to go out there and be like, yeah, we've done VidCons on every continent. We've done, we've had a million people come to our events. It just wasn't the way we imagined it in 2017. But because the plan was there and we were always about community, we jumped into it and, you know, I turned a team of people that were live event, that were basically physical live event producers into digital event producers. And that was you know, it had its ups and downs, but, you know, kudos to the team for, you know, buying in, embracing it and changing what they do and, and figuring out how to make the dream happen and the vision happen, even though we couldn't leave our houses. I, I love, first of all, the acknowledgement and respect for the people who executed, because I, I know, again, having worked with you, but also knowing how big companies can sometimes work. There are folks who sometimes say, you know, well, I, you know, I got us through it. And it's, it's really refreshing to hear you, you know, say we got us through it. Everyone it was, did it. Like, everyone did. Yeah. Everyone did everything. Like, like the, the guy who still does all the live streaming and the video for VidCons now around the world, Kyle, you know, Kyle, Kyle learned how to be a, a, a digital video broadcaster. You know, we had, we had I, Fiona. I, like to think who I had were, a little. I'd like to think I did a little to help that. Can I just oh, say? Oh, you did. Like, no. yeah. <laughs> but what I mean, like you worked with Fiona. Fiona was right. like, um, you know, Fiona produced events. She did, you know, stuff on the show floor. She became the, the producer of all these digital events and then ended up taking over and being, when we went back to real life, you know, being the, the, the executive producer of the live event in Baltimore. So yeah. we had people who really stepped up. And, um, and everybody really did, but there were people who like learned entirely new career skills um, because we sort of had to. And look, I will also say kudos to Viacom slash Viacom CBS slash Paramount, because not only did they, did, were they, did they support us all the way through, even though we were losing money, you know, and they supported the fact that we don't want to go back in 2021 and potentially have, you know, uh, a lot of kids getting COVID and dying, which we were the, most scared about because COVID came back in 2021, as you'll remember. And um, so it was a lot of people, a lot of support, a lot of belief. And so, you know, we couldn't have done it without any of the support and the belief and everybody out there making that happen. No, I love that. I, I love too the idea that that it's not as important to try to hit a million people in person, right? Because you, you have so many uh, businesses that try to hit an artificial 
goal that they set some years prior. And then as circumstances change and as the market shifts and, and you know, everybody's footing redevelops, they sometimes keep those uh, goals, even though they're no longer reasonable. Uh, to hear that, that you really stuck to the larger goal, which is affect a million people, right? Have that impact on a million potential creators uh, really warms my heart because I, I think that's the most important thing. And really it was at the core of what you wanted to hit early on. And I think to be able to not only do that, but do that with a team of people who really stepped up to the challenge is a genuine once in a lifetime experience. I mean, you must feel that way about them in that time. Oh yeah, absolutely. It was, it was amazing. I mean, think about the people who like ran food and beverage at the events, right? And they, they're like the ones that made sure that there was coffee in every room and that the, you know, and that the, the big events were catered for the clients and things like that. And they dealt with the convention centers and, you know, and, and, and suddenly they're like, Oh, you mean I'm producing sessions um, that are streaming <laughs> and the people stepped up. It was great. So you've moved away from VidCon. You're now independent, working on a number of projects. You know, I, I get your newsletter uh, in my inbox and on my LinkedIn feed, you know, inside the creator economy. You comment on things happening, not just on YouTube, of course, but broadly across the social media and online video ecosystems. So let me take a step back and ask, like, what do you see that's happening today that is particularly interesting or compelling for you? Is there a new platform or a new development on an existing platform that you find interesting? Or is it, you know, new personalities emerging that, that are challenging the status quo for how to produce content? You know, there's a lot of interesting stuff happening in the creator economy. And there are a lot of trends. And I talk about trends every year in my newsletter. And I think they're still, they're still and I actually just spoke about this at a, a conference earlier this week. Everyone's talking about generative AI, so I'm not going to talk too much about it because you can, you know, you got every rock you pick up, somebody's like, generative AI is changing the world or generative AI is going to make us all, you know, whatever. But I do think that I was there at the PC revolution when it totally changed computers. I was there at the internet revolution when it totally changed media uh, and has led us to where we are now. Um, there at the creator revolution, which has totally, you know, allowed people to go direct and build their audiences. And I do think that the, that what gen AI is going to allow us to do is as big a revolution. You look at what just launched, which is the Sora models from open AI, where they're actually doing a minute of stuff that is HD. It's really high quality. It's amazing. You still have to tell stories with it. And, you know, chat GPT is a prediction engine and the stories are boring. So there's a place for storytellers, but ChatGPT will enable so many more people to do amazing visual storytelling, just like YouTube and TikTok and, and others have enabled people to do visual storytelling. It's just going to add another layer and another, uh, another opening of the kimono to the democratization of storytelling and media and reaching an audience. And just like every other ones that I talked through, some people got disrupted and had to go out and learn something else. People do it. I mean, look at what the VidCon team did when they went from doing face-to-face -face events to doing live-streamed events. You lived that. You were doing that. You had an amazing platform that was doing amazing things with building community that way. And so I think this is just another step function. Here's what I think is different, though. It took really 30 years for the internet and digital technology to really transform and upend traditional media. You know, it started out as print and then it was, you know, radio and music and photos and then video. I'm not sure we have 30 months this time around. So it's going to be fun to watch. All these transitions are great. Anybody who's listening is thinking like, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? Just think about that guy at VidCon or girl or whoever it was who was working with food and beverage and was all about getting your coffee to the rooms on time. They became an amazing event, digital event producer. So you can do it but transitions are tough on people. So that's one, I'm not gonna get too much into it, but I just think that's so interesting watching that play out. It allows all of us to up-level our skills. That really resonates for me. I, I think what I get scared of in terms of the upcoming AI revolution isn't necessarily replacement so much as I, I feel, in some ways I kind of feel like my father, you know, my dad who is a little tech averse, he's not, 
uneducated. He can manage a computer just fine. Even when things break, he's not totally out of touch, but it gets harder and harder as time goes on to keep up. And I think my concern, and I don't know if you feel the same way, but I think my concern is just that as things get more complex, as the world gets more, um, as the world has more tools to play with and technologies to learn, how do you keep a fresh eye on everything? How do you keep up, not just with the use of the technology, but the impact it can have and the creativity it can offer, it, it, particularly in the ways that aren't obvious from the get-go? You know, I think the thing to do is to track the people that are on the forefront of it and spend time looking at what they're talking about and then exploring it yourself. I mean, I remember when TikTok came out and everybody was like, oh my God, it's vertical, it's short form. Who's going to watch this? It's stupid. I don't understand it. It's girls lip syncing in the corner. And what I was like, oh, but I don't get it. I'm not going to pay attention to it. And I went out there and said, and this is in 2017 and 18, 2018, I'm like, take my TikTok challenge, load it on your phone, make a video every day for 30 days, and you'll get the platform. This is what I did in 2016, 2015. With Snap, like I didn't get Snap, it was vertical. I was like, what is this yellow thing? I don't have any friends on it. But I went out every day for 30 days and made a Snapchat video. Mostly it was me walking in the hills behind my house doing a weather report. One of them even got picked up by the Snap editorial team and they ran it, which I love. But, um, but so the same thing here. Like I was at this event over the last two days and I spoke about the creator economy, but there were a lot of people doing sessions on AI for creators and I sat through them and I learned a ton about things I did not even know. Like I've got like a ton of different things I want to look at. And most of these platforms and new tools, you can try out for free. So don't be afraid of them. Just think about like, and, and also think about what you like and what you don't like. Like I'm not a great video editor. I'm a bad video editor. But AI tools let me edit video. Like I use Descript now and it does a good job letting me edit video. Um, so and I'm not, I'm a terrible artist, terrible. Like I can't, I, I like drawing, but I'm a terrible drawer. I've never studied it. But with Mid Journey and Dolly was part of ChatGPT and Stable Diffusion, I create really fun art with this, you know, my co-pilot or my partner, which is now, now at Dolly 3, because I subscribed to ChatGPT. And I put them as cover art on my newsletters and it's really fun and, I don't know, in part I do it for myself and hopefully it resonates, but all those things let you explore parts of yourself that you might not be very good at, but that with a little help from AI, you can get a lot better at. I like that. But I also like that there's an element of just have fun with it in, in the underlying subtext of what you're saying, that it's yeah. not so much, don't, don't take it too seriously. Is No one's watching your TikToks. <laughs> How dare you? How dare you? Well, not I in the could. first 30 days. <laughs> I mean, my my witty banter on what's happening in Marvel Comics is absolutely rocking the industry. You, how that was, dare that you, was a broad you, not an individual you. That was the uh, plural version of you. I don't know. I felt like you pointed at me emotionally there. It's all I'm saying. No, 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 no. I mean, like, if, <laughs> if you take my challenge, the first 30 days, if people start watching it, great. But no one's going to watch it. No, no one watches my TikToks now. I do. I go out and do... Like I do beach video every time I'm on a beach. I'm like, here I am on the beach. Isn't it beautiful? Look at it. And you know, I got like 500 people who subscribe sure. to me, follow me. Do you think that there's something lost in investing in platforms that may fall off? I mean, we talk about like back in the day, again, back in the pandemic, you know, there was this big push towards clubhouse and house party <laughs> and you know, all these live audio platforms, they were going to be the next big thing at meta for a hot minute. Uh, now they've all gone by the wayside. You know, now Be Real is sort of changing its original motif into this more sponsored and celebrity centric approach. Um, I, I feel like sometimes I want to invest in new platforms. I also feel like it's going to be a waste of time because I don't think that they're going to last. And inevitably, I'm almost proven right by just how e ephemeral and quick they end up being. Um, do you think there's something to learn from those experiences despite that? Or is it more about plant your flag everywhere and see what happens? You know, it's it, well. I don't know if any of us have enough time to plant our flag everywhere and see what happens. Although there are AI tools that help things like Opus Clip is a sponsor of mine that allows you to take your long form and turn it to short form and put it on these platforms. But hey, aside, if they want to sponsor me, I'll keep mentioning them too. I just want to point yeah, that out. But anyway, right, yeah. Okay, cool. Maybe they will. <laughs> they're, they're really good. Um, but, but I, I will say the perception that creators are having of platforms is changing. And I think 
if you're going to go out and invest in these new platforms and invest your time, you could learn from it that you can apply in other places. It is hard to move communities from one place to another and particularly hard as a platform dies. Be like, come on over. We're all going over to LinkedIn audio events now. But if you look at these platforms as more top of funnel awareness things, which by the way, that's what TikTok is. TikTok is not a place to build a career. It's a place to build a big audience and then figure out moving them somewhere else. Find out where you want to move people to, whether it's Patreon or, you know, Kajabi or Uscreen or Mighty Networks or whatever, um, or, you know, and, and, and have that already there. So as you go through this process of building yourself up on those platforms, you are always trying to capture the creme de la creme, the, creme, the people that really like you, your super fans to an experience that is controlled and owned by you. And I say this, and I really need to do it myself on LinkedIn because I don't do a very good job of this either. And I'm thinking about how to do it. And I actually went to a LinkedIn session at this conference uh, yesterday, a friend of mine, Judy Fox, who gave me some really good ideas about how to do it uh, and to get some owned and get their email addresses and start to build those direct connections, which I'm going to do in the next couple of days. Anyway, always learn, but think about them as top of funnel in many ways. And you know, and, and if they speak to you, like I'm, I could be on Instagram and I could, I mean, I'm on Instagram and I'm doing anything on Instagram. I could be on TikTok doing more than just shooting videos of the ocean. Um, I'm on LinkedIn and I'm deep into LinkedIn. I'm all in on LinkedIn. And if LinkedIn, you know, LinkedIn changes, like they're taking creator mode away and their, 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 their layout, their, their creator partnership team, just like most of the other platforms, they've had layoffs there. But, um, if you think about it as a way to learn and grow and build and connect, but then figure out a way to get the people that you work with the most and other in an own place, that's probably a good way to think about it. When you say an owned place, I, I, I don't want to presume. You mean something like get them into a Discord, get them into a Slack, get them somewhere where you have more direct engagement, even an email list, I'm guessing. Right, yeah, or a Discord, Slack. Um, Uscreen has communities now. Mighty Networks has private label communities that are really interesting. Um, Kajabi's got community because they, um, they bought Terry Use Vibly. Um, and they also have courseware and other things, but think about having something that's more private for just you and your fans. Like I'm doing meetups now and I just do them randomly wherever I go somewhere. I'm like, Hey, come meet me at a bar. We're going to have a drink and hang out and talk. And sometimes it's 60 people. And sometimes it's 40 people. Sometimes it's 20 people. Um, you know, when I did one in Singapore, it was like 10 of us. It's fine. Um, but think about ways to do that because now I have people that want to sponsor my meetups, which is like, Oh, cool. So yeah, but it didn't start because I wanted to have sponsors. I started just because, well, I could go out and eat by myself or I could see if there are any readers here who may want to hang out with me. I love the idea of TikTok as top of funnel. I think that's the one thing that I want to pull away from all this, which is that, you know, it, it doesn't, not every platform is good for the long term. And I think to your point, like you really do need to think about it as a, a t as a funnel or a waterfall, right? How does this lead to capturing something that is really valuable, but also doubling back to the idea that it's actually as much as possible also about real world interactions, right? It's 60 people at, at a meetup isn't as grand as having 600,000 views on a video, but it's 60 real people with whom you can have deep engaging conversations between each other and to each other and that kind of interaction is is should be your end result right it's about building those connections and and even if you're trying to sustain a business that's the way to make it work well and if they're the right people companies will pay to get that access as well yeah right so yeah it's it's super interesting. and remember platforms change i mean yeah had i spent a lot of time on snap i would have learned a lot about stories and this and that but i was like a a, a creator manager post on linkedin i just love this he was like you know i'd put my clients on snap um, but they really don't show enough skin for Snap. And Snap has become very much of a, you know, it's it's like, yes, it's great if you want to do that. You can make a lot of their, it was like, I think TikTok's diamonds, where they crystals on Snap. You can make a lot of crystals or whatever. But, you know, the, you, I'm not going to do 100 pictures a day on Snap. And I'm, you know, nobody wants to look at my skin. Um, but that's a, you know, that that would be a platform I would abandon a lot of energy on, but I would have learned from it. Let's talk about Snap for a second, which had its heyday and is now sort of struggling. They had a recent recall of drones. But the one thing that people do go back to for Snap is exactly what you said. Like, it's it's a place to see a lot of skin, even though, of course, it's not, you know, adult or, or, or you know, um, intentionally adult, I should say, in nature. It's but, more but, juvenile, but yeah, okay. Well, it is. But, but that's my point. Like, if I'm a creator today 
and I am looking for growth and opportunities and building, what are some things that you've learned over the course of your career that you would point me towards? What are things that not so much the like, how do I, you know, find my first 10,000 followers on LinkedIn so much as like, what are the, 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 the truisms that you've learned over the course of your career that you would point somebody towards at the beginning of theirs? I would say, find out what you really like and what you're interested in and what you want to do and just do that. So many people like try and do the, what the hot thing is. We're going to go on the hot trend or we're going to, you know, everybody's doing Mr. Beast style reality and challenge videos. So I'm going to do that. Well, you know what? You're going to burn out on that and you're not going to like it. And it's going to be painful. And, and, and you know, eventually you're going to be like, I'm going to quit. But if you're doing something that you really like and you can build that in, it's a much more sustainable. Like I, I, it turns out I really like writing and sharing my opinions and, and doing that. But, you know, every now and then I like doing something goofy and silly. I like, I'm just going to do it. And if people like it, great. If they want to come along for the ride, great. If they don't, I don't care. And by the way, that's the definition of a creator. To me, the definition of a creator is somebody who's going to do it because they like it. And hopefully other people come along for the ride where the influencer is, is just doing the things that they think are gonna build big audiences so they can influence people and make money. Maybe that's what you wanna do, but figure that out. But I would say you're gonna be much better off mentally if you just do the things you like and hone your craft and bring people along for the ride and then hopefully build a big enough audience so that you can all you know revel in the community that you've built and maybe make money too. When you think about your legacy in this space, in the creator space, in the technology space, in the media space, what are the things you want people to take away? What's the one thing that you would point to as like, this is the impact I wanted to have? I don't know. It's kind of like, it's, it's legacy is one of those things that I'm like, I never really even think about because I just want to have fun and do the things for me that are enjoyable, which is how I've lived my career. And, you know, I want to build safe spaces for everybody. I want to be um, the person who's the champion of the creator, not the businesses, even though I built big businesses on the backs of creators. Um, but it's always like doing the right thing for people. And, um, but also like, you know, don't be so serious, have fun, try and have fun with stuff. And if you're having fun, hopefully people can have fun along with it. So I don't know if that's a legacy or not, but, um, you know, don't take yourself seriously. Don't take the world too seriously and try and enjoy your time here. And, you know, if you find, if you glom onto something or you can help other people, great. Um, it's not a very good answer, but I'm not really that much on the whole, like, I want to be on a bust outside of the U.S. Supreme Court. I don't like I, that. That's not the kind of legacy stuff I care about. No, I, 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 the kinds of things you're talking about are the things I care about, and hopefully people listening and watching do too. It shouldn't be about building a career so that you're, uh, you know, on the Supreme Court. It should be about having an effect on the people's lives that you're building for. And that, that to me resonates. That's, that's what I care about. Well, try and think of one famous person from 500 years ago. Okay, I can think of Christopher Columbus. How about 1,000 years ago? Oh, 500 years ago, definitely Gutenberg. Um, but, you know, it, we're all going to fade into history. And very, you know, so make sure you just take care of people while you're here. Yeah. Not me. I'm going to live forever. But I, I get that for you. I understand. Well, no, it, yeah. Even if you do, no one's going to know what you did 500 years ago. That's a fair Unless point. They're still listening to your podcast because you're telling those stories, but you know, God, can you imagine how boring that would be? I mean, right? That's you know. Plus, but you got to imagine 500 years from now, it's all being beamed directly into your head. They wouldn't even know what to do with the data from today. Well, 500 years from now, we're all going to be little ectoplasmic balls floating around the universe, you know, disassociated from reality in our own virtual filter bubbles. So, you know, I, don't know. I mean, I don't know. But well, I think we're ending on a fairly optimistic, uplifting note then. I love it. Jim, this has been a tremendous pleasure and, frankly, a little uh, more forward thinking than I was considering when we started. So thank you. Oh, cool, um, no problem. Uh, and I'll see you on the ectoplasmic bubble other side. I can't wait. Uh, if people want to join uh, and, and learn more about what you're up to, you want them, where, where should they go? What's the best place to follow along with uh, what you're working on? Go to LinkedIn, connect with me, follow me, and subscribe to the newsletter inside the creator economy. It comes out every week and you get... Hopefully some fun stuff along with my takes on some of the big stories and the news stories you should know. And then I'll occasionally just drop in something that I'm interested in. So hopefully you will be too. Awesome. Thank you again so much for the time. Have a great day. No problem. Thanks, Jason. Bye.